Uh, as you mentioned, I'm Jason Gillespie. It's great to see everyone here at ETAIL again. I oversee analytics and insights for Critio. It is my honor and pleasure to have my friend and colleague, Louisa, up here. I'll let her introduce herself. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here. Uh, my name is Louisa Chen. I am the CFO of Soul Society. And in a strange twist of fate, I'm also running the performance marketing program at Soul Society. Soul Society is a digitally native brand of women's shoes, handbags, and accessories. We were previously backed by Nordstrom, so strong fashion roots there. Um, how I came to run marketing at Soul Society, um, as a CFO, I have to keep track of every single penny that comes with the company. And marketing, because we're very direct response oriented, marketing was our biggest budget. So it was a great way to keep track of how the money was spent. And as I like to say, direct response marketing is very much like running a stock portfolio. So it just came naturally, and I really enjoy it. Well, it's great to have you here today. Yeah. And there aren't many people that do both CMO and CFO. So uh, Louise is also very humble just talking about one of those. Um, slide here. So short agenda. Let's start by just recovering where we are as an industry in terms of advertising. Then let's define the open internet, think about what that means. We'll talk a little bit about some custom research that we've done at Critio regarding the Toys R Us implosion. We'll talk a bit about finding the right mix among marketing channels, and then some next steps for retailers. So where are we in the world of online ad spend? No shock here, it's still growing, and it's still growing big. And that's gonna continue for the next four or five years. You're looking at 10 to 20% growth. So if you're out there and you're a marketer, and this is data from eMarketer, if anyone has eMarketer access, you can source it, you can probably Google it. They make a lot available for free, a lot more available for a very expensive monthly <laughs> or annual subscription. Uh, nonetheless, what you'll see here is that traditional is not exactly going away. A lot of that is TV. TV is remarkably resilient, even in the face of cord cutting. Some of that's because of squishy definitions. Mm -hmm. What is Hulu? What is over, you know, what's over the air versus linear TV versus traditional? Uh, so TV is hanging in there, print is dying, uh, out of home is sort of hanging around too, but really the growth is in online and digital. So if you're a marketer, you wanna lean into that because that's where things are continuing to go. This was actually a Criteo and Euromonitor survey that we did as part of a report called The State of Ad Tech 2019. The full report's available on our website if you're interested in more. In that survey, we specifically asked marketers, how are you allocating your money across all these different channels? But we chose to do it in a way that was a little different from the way a lot of surveys asked. We included initiatives that aren't necessarily part of what you'd think of as either traditional or digital marketing. And in specific, your email platform, uh, your content marketing, bringing people to you, inbound marketing through the use of great and useful content, uh, your landing page and your website, and even affiliate. And if you look at that broader spectrum, what you can see here is that while paid display is at the top, and then traditional marketing, and social, which is often largely paid versus organic, there is still a lot below that. So there's a long tail here, there's a lot of channels, and later on, Louisa is gonna speak some about how you kind of differentiate across those channels and look at what works better than others. So what is this idea of the open internet? There's a lot of talk out there about a walled garden or a closed platform, there's not as much about the open internet, so we thought it would be interesting to define this. And the definition that we've come up with is really based on the characteristics of the environment. If you think about every time you show an ad, there's one party, which is you. You wanna show that ad to someone for whom that ad is relevant and hopefully drives some outcome. That outcome could be an app install, it could be a qualified site visit, it could be a conversion. But in the other side of that, there's the publisher and there's a place where the ad's being shown. And both of those factors come together when you're defining what is the open internet. It's an environment that allows you as the advertiser or a publisher to choose exactly who they wanna work with, decide when and how data is shared, and we think this is really critical because it means there needs to be that democratization of data that we've heard about today, uh, there needs to be data transparency, and there needs to be a fair exchange of value when data's coming in and out and you should control how you measure success. Vendors should not be grading their own homework, everything should be transparent in terms of performance and how you measure that performance. So why do we think this is an opportunity for retailers? 
Well, fundamentally, right now, a lot of ad spend is still being captured by mechanisms that we would consider a walled garden under the previous definition, which means you either don't have full visibility, full measurement transparency, or the ability to pull back all the data that you would like. If you don't have one of those three, we're classing it as a walled garden. If you have all that, we're considering it the open internet. The reason this is an interesting distribution here, this 70-30, is because if you think about where are people actually spending their time, uh, and again, this is Nielsen and third-party data such as eMarketer, it's about 50-50. And a lot of that is because of things like apps that are considered open internet. There's now a lot of ways to advertise to people while they're in an app. And also all of you. Retailers are in part, part of the new media landscape. There was one of these Forrester or Gartner studies, I forget who, that was something like retailers are the new media moguls. Because you, you're just like a media property. You have an audience, you have engagement, uh, and you have people that you can monetize either through sales or through the fact that you're a media player. So when you think about open internet and you think about the time spent, sorry, let me just back up here, that difference the 30% of ad spend versus the 50% of time means that there are fewer dollars but chasing more eyeballs. So there's an opportunity there to apply more dollars on that open web slice and still maintain an ROI or cost per install that's favorable for your business. Now to add a little color to how you think about all these channels, walled garden and open internet, I'm gonna pass it over to Louisa for a second to speak about how that works at Soul Society. Yeah, so um, if you can go back to that last slide, Jason. Sure thing. If you look at the ad spend ca captured, we are absolutely in that 30-70 in terms of our spend. 70% is very much walled garden. I'm sure everyone here is familiar with Facebook. The way they can target, you can get super surgical, um, and you can see on a minute-by-minute -minute basis whether something's converting, something's working, or whatever it is. So we spend a large amount of our money there because it really does capture the full funnel. You can get someone into the funnel, retarget, and then retarget them again. Um, we would love to diversify away from walled gardens for that very reason. And the reason why 30% is only spent on the open internet is because you can't target as specifically as you can within a walled garden, and that totally makes sense. So the way we look at performance marketing, at least at Soul Society, is it's pretty, um, traditional funnel, so we have top, middle, bottom. And our top funnel is, as I mentioned, Facebook, Pinterest. We have a huge influencer program that kind of acts as a top and middle funnel because the influencers really have the audience's attention. And once they, um, I shouldn't say advertise, but they promote something that they like, we usually see a conversion rate that's pretty much immediate. And then if people don't convert immediately from the top funnel, we have programs like Critio or you know, Google Shopping, Google AdWords to capture them at the bottom. So pretty traditional in that sense. We don't have a ton of channels. I feel like there's a lot of noise in the data if, you have two, if you're you know, in two main places at once. So we tend to focus on what really works um, and that's why we're so direct response oriented. Now because I know you <laughs> and I know your numbers focus since you're CFO and CMO, how do you think about testing? Which channels do you find are harder or easier to test? So we're lucky that we're a digitally native brand. Um, and all of our channels that we market on are digital. So um, to give you a little context, uh, you know, we're a shoe company, we're in fashion. So even if we get all of our marketing right and the product's not resonating, we're pretty inefficient and we have no room to test. But there are months when we're hitting on all cylinders. We have the perfect product, we're talking to the right audience, we're talking to the customer in a way that she's responding and converting. So it's in those months that we pull out the budget and we just start testing. And it's great when we can work with Critio or Facebook or whatever it is and say, okay, we've got $5,000, we've got $1,000, we have $500, let's test now. And um, I think one piece of advice I would give, what's been really helpful, is to constantly tell your customer rep you're always open to testing. And so you're always top of mind when something new is happening. Um, so that's our approach to testing. So whenever we're super efficient, we have extra budget, we test immediately to see what's going on. And what's great about digital is that you can turn something on in a day. Whereas if you're you know, testing for traditional out of home or a catalog, it's not just money you're spending, but it's a lot of human time, right? You can't tell your creative team to turn something around for a catalog or television or something creative in a matter of hours. Whereas if you test something online, you can 
go into your digital library of resources and pull something out and test immediately. So that's our philosophy. Whenever we have, we know we're efficient and we have extra budget, we, we use all of that budget to test. Great, thanks, Lisa. So question that's somewhat rhetorical. Can retailers win in this world? And the reason I wanted to put this was because I had an idea what you heard about an hour ago when we made this deck, which is it seems as though Amazon is taking over the world. If you look at the RBC presentation, they're obviously doing very well. They're gonna to continue to do well. With that said, we think there are some shades of gray here that we see in some of our data that make it a much more favorable environment for retailers who aren't named Amazon, and I wanted to present some of that. And in specific, let me just back up so I don't uh, hit the punchline too early. In specific, you hear about failure after failure after failure. Radio Shack closing you know, thousands of stores. Gymboree just went out of business. Sears is struggling or on its last leg. Um, Toys R Us. I mean, I was a Toys R Us kid, just like hopefully a lot of you. The giraffe, the toy store, it was a ton of fun. Now I have a two-year-old. Well, the toy store went away, but I still have the two-year-old. So where are those people now? Babies are us, users, raise your hands, right? You had to go somewhere. So we thought it would be really interesting research to go out and ask these people, well, where are you now? Where are you shopping? The interesting thing about it is it didn't exactly tow the party line that everybody was automatically going to Amazon. A huge portion are, certainly. Amazon's a great business and they have a lot of advantages. And between 28 and 34% of those shoppers did choose Amazon but a significant uh, majority actually chose non-Amazon options led by Walmart and Target. Of course, Walmart came out with very strong numbers this week, something like 5% same store growth. They're clearly leveraging location uh, along with digital initiatives to pick up a lot of these users where they can. Target's hanging in there. And then there's this long tail that's still getting a very significant uh, portion of these users. When we dived into this data and we asked, well, why did you pick your replacement? We got the usual answers. Convenience, which is always sort of ill-defined price, range of products. I'm not gonna harp on that. It's the same thing you saw earlier. What I think is more interesting is if you look at how the choice of replacement varies based on what the user thought was important, and I'll give you one specific example. When we asked people how important is location, is it a factor, is it not a factor? If location is not a factor, then Amazon is getting a huge amount of that business. But if location is a factor, Walmart's getting almost the same slice that Amazon used to get. So what this means is, if you have some sort of competitive advantage, could be a brick and mortar presence, could be amazing service, could be the lowest price, could be unique inventory, you can still, even in this world, we believe, lean into that advantage. Because what the data is saying is that these users who used to go to Toys R Us, as an example, are by no means a homogenous, monolithic group of consumers. They have different preferences, and those different preferences are expressing themselves by different choices of replacement retailers. And even better, the good news just keeps coming here, folks. Even better, when we ask people, if you're going to Amazon or Walmart or Target, would you consider other retailers? Or are you really locked into just that one? Very few are locked in. That small green bar at the bottom are the people who are locked into that one retailer. The other bars, which are between 89 and 83% of the populations, are willing to consider other options. That's great news because it means when one of these retailers goes out of business, that set of customers is not immediately building loyalty elsewhere. They're still promiscuous, they're still available, they're still ready for you to go after them. And what helps that? Brand. And who better to talk about brand than someone who's had to build one really from the ground up, so I'm gonna send it over to Louisa to talk about how brand really matters, even in a direct response and metrics-driven world. Totally, um, as a CFO, I never put any importance on brand, right? When my marketing team used to come to me and say, we wanna, put a billboard up or a commercial, I just laugh and say, oh, I don't want to put money into a dumpster. But the question that keeps me up by night is cost per order, meaning every single order I have to pay for because I'm not a brand like Nike where you just type in nike.com to order. We have to pay for our traffic to come in and it's just not the initial you know, cost per acquisition or CAC, right? Even after that, you have to get 
the consumer's attention. And it's a noisy world out there. Everyone now is advertising on the same channels we are. I think if you got a head start you know, five, six years ago, you can still capture the imagination of your consumers. But today, it's just littered with a thousand different brands trying to get your attention. So what I'm focused on now is how do you build a brand in an efficient way, right? Instead of just dumping money into the ether for a television commercial or paying a celebrity to wear a shoe or praying all night, how do you do that? And that's a question that dogs me constantly, but you know, in a way, brand is the shortcut for consumers. Um, it really, if you have brand recognition, they come to your site, it builds loyalty, and how do you reach them? I mean, there's a ton of different ways to reach them, but you know, you have to have a great product, you have to know what you stand for, and then the customers will come. And I think the tactics are, one is luck, you tap into the zeitgeist, you capture lightning in a bottle. Um, a few examples that I'm incredibly envious of are all birds, right? It's a sneaker, it's captured the imaginations of a ton of people, and people love it for the message, for the sneaker, Glossier. It's now a household name, right? Um, so that's fantastic. Or you can spend a ton of money just to get, just so people know where you are. So you spend a ton of money digitally or out of home or whatever it is. Um, or the slow and steady way, if you have cash and you have great backing, great investors, great ideas, um, it's like a slow build. You, you spend years perfecting your product. Um, another way to get there is brick and mortar. I know that there's a lot of talk about brick and mortar dying, but especially with shoes and fashion, people want to see it, touch it, know what it looks like, see what it looks like on their body. So I think being only digital, you can definitely get there, but you do, really do need the omni-channel presence to get your brand out there. Thanks, Lisa. So what kind of next steps might we take here as marketers? We thought it would be interesting to propose a brief audit. If you think about how you're spending your money, think about are you getting the data you need? Do you have the full control and visibility? And are you measuring and managing that in your own systems or are your vendors grading their own homework? Right. And that audit will allow you to determine the fraction of your spend that's walled or maybe even semi-walled and true open internet. Then marry that with a little bit of custom research. It's very easy to do. You probably have some sort of existing customer experience program. Instead of just researching how your customers feel about the service they're getting, about the transaction, about the website, I would advise you to tack onto that questions about their media consumption, about their usage of devices. Getting to know your customers better makes a lot of sense. Sure, that average between open web and walled garden time usage might be 50-50. The average rainfall at my house in LA is about two inches a month, but you're not gonna get much rain between <laughs> April and December because averages are misleading. So you really wanna know this for your own customers. Why not tack it onto surveys that you're probably already doing? And then test and learn, and this is kind of that research test learn is an ongoing Kaizen continuous improvement sort of feedback loop for your marketing operations. So that's the end of our formal comments. Louise and I will be around uh, the rest of the show. If you'd like more data on what happened to those Toys R Us and Babies R Us customers, we have a full research report that's available on Critio.com or just uh, come up to us. We're friendlier than we look, uh, especially at the Mimosa stand. And we have about 51 seconds, I guess, if there's any quick questions. Yep, please raise your hand nice and high so we can run over for a mic with the microphone for a quick question. Anyone in the room? Okay, then they're just going to have to get a mimosa from you. That's why. <laughs> thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Yeah, it's a great job, actually. Thank hey, you. Hey, great job. Great